We begin with the order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sin to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the grace of Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each of you. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of 
the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Let us pray. Sovereign God, you turn your greatness into goodness for all the peoples on earth. Shape us into willing servants of your kingdom and make us desire always and only your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. <laughs> Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant to us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I give you, you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those from whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. Jesus called to them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as rulers, lord it over them, and the great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. There are a number of famous stories from inside the Fab Four world, the Beatles' life, through the journey of getting together and coming to fame and dealing with the world, looking upon them with such starry eyes. 
Well, late in the 1960s, having hit a height of popularity rarely seen on this planet, the Beatles found themselves simply burnt out, wondering if there was more to life than the riches and fame. Paul McCartney said, they were spiritually empty and struggling to find meaning in life beyond all the craziness that they were experiencing. As many may know, a few of them turned to the Eastern religious philosophies to potentially fill that void. So in 1968, they called off all their other work and went to a famous pulp culture, Eastern philosopher and spiritual leader known as the Maharashi. They went to his compound. He was a diminutive man from India and did not shy away from his growing popularity. So the Beatles joined him as well as others at his compound to search for truth and meaning. Not too long after getting there, Ringo and Paul would find that the effort was fairly fruitless and would leave. And eventually John and George also later decided to leave in disappointment though they certainly said they were impacted by the experience. However, in the early stages at being at this place with other people, for whatever reason, the Maharashi was going on a helicopter ride, and there was room for one more person. So within the Beatles, there was sort of this competition, if you will, to see who would get that seat. And John finagled it the best and got to go on the ride. Afterwards, Paul asked John, why did you want to go so badly to maneuver to be chosen? John replied, well, I thought maybe when we are up alone in the helicopter, just the two of us, the Maharashi might have slipped me the answer to the meaning of life. In other words, doing so without the rest of the would-be followers all around. And Paul McCartney has stated many times since that that was very much like John in his thinking. Even among these fab four, jealousy and jostling for position still at times raised its head. If you know any Beatles history at all, you know that these four, what these four people experience, not only in the musical world, but in life itself, which in many ways still continues for Ringo and Paul to this day, what they experience was unlike anything that had come before in terms of fame, popularity, and even power. But yet here they were, spiritually empty, still looking from some other type of elixir or power for life. Now, I tell the story today not to promote or lift up an Eastern approach to spirituality at all, but rather a sense of how the Beatles, when going through these experiences, only had each other to decipher what was going on among them. When I think of the 12 disciples, sometimes I can imagine that the uniqueness of their journey with Christ was something that made it hard to relate to those outside their inner circle. Now, we certainly know that their inner circle probably also included not just the 12 disciples, but also Mary Magdalene and some other women who are not highlighted. But still, it was a very unique experience to travel with this Messiah who was upsetting and turning the ways and views of life upside down with almost everything that he taught, proclaimed, and did. However, even though it was a small inner group, power struggles still occurred. Almost like within the Beatles, when John Lennon worked his way so that he could have that one-on-one -on -one experience to maybe find out something or get some answer that the others didn't have. Likewise, this occurred with the disciples. In this morning's text, we have two of the disciples, James and John, going to Jesus and asking that they might be able to sit one on his right and the other on his left hand when he came into power. A pretty bold ask, if you will. In Matthew's telling of the story, it is told slightly different, and it is their mother who approaches Jesus with the same question for her sons. Either way, 
When the word gets back to the other 10 disciples, we are told in both accounts, they are angry. The reality is, as human beings, even ones who are in the inner circle of the in the know group, struggles of positions, struggles of ego, struggles of power still continue. It seems as though in our life, we simply cannot escape it. Even if we've risen in our jobs, our vocations, our social status, our financial resources, there is still often for many a notion to keep one's head on a swivel to make sure they are one step ahead of the others. Obviously, such a drive can sometimes produce some positive things in our lives, but there are also moments when the quest for power can get in the way of relationship. And such as is the case for these two disciples today, requesting something of which they didn't even know what they were asking for in the first place. However, they cannot stop seeking to get that power, that special place. It wasn't very long ago we heard in the gospel text about the disciples arguing among themselves as to who was the greatest. And then here it's sort of like another twist and angle as it doesn't matter who's the greatest as long as I get good seats in the end at the party. We see this unfolding all around us all the time. In some ways, it sort of seems wired within us from an early age. If you grew up with other siblings, as soon as we recognize there is a presence of another who might get more than me, all that stuff kicks in. It's like the one sibling sharing with another sibling that candy bar and breaking it in such a way that maybe one's half is just a little bit bigger than the other. Among siblings, the other cry of power is the call of shotgun when heading toward a vehicle for a ride. This becomes a prime example of not only having a better view for the journey, but probably more so as a little exercise of power over another. Oftentimes, when such matters occur about where one sits in the car or or who gets what bedroom or what bed, birth order, birth rights, and all kinds of other measuring equations enter into the picture so that a stake of power may be made. The problem with all these things is that we can turn what can be a driving positive force into an ego-building domination effort over others to either make them feel less than or somehow make us feel more powerful or better about ourselves. When we hear this lesson from the Bible this morning, we hear how Jesus addresses this whole notion of power. He says, Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. It sure sounds like a great teaching. And we certainly can see its value in this context and in many others. But how hard is this concept to live out when the truth of the matter is, when we enter into our realm of social circles, of a new neighborhood, even a faith community like a church, there's a part of our brains that often begins to fire off questions within ourselves that says things like, where do you rank here? Where do you stand? Who will be with me? Who is ahead of me? Who is behind me? It's sometimes a voice that speaks very loud at times. Other times it may be more subtle and even sometimes just dormant. But nonetheless, it points to a way and outlook on life that seeks to put oneself at the center. Many times it has been said that the ground is level at the foot of the cross, meaning as we stand before the crucified Messiah, We are all equal in our fallenness, our shortcomings and brokenness, and equal in receiving the grace and forgiveness of God. And while most of the time that strikes us as very good news, as indeed the gospel, there are less proud moments in our lives in which we find it all a little bit unfair. We often find it not unfair because we are getting something we think we have earned, But more so, and more often, we tend to focus on somebody else getting something we think 
they do not deserve because of some of their actions. The power of the rationalization of our own minds leads us to believe that our sins are more easily explained and understood versus another shortcomings, which was simply them being selfish, of course, so they deserve to be a little bit lower on the ladder to God. How do you view power in your life? How do you in intersect that view of power with your own faith and spiritual growth? Do we take time to even bring the two concepts together in our thinking? Or do they just seem too contrary to one another and that we just don't want to go there? Exploring this notion of power and our corresponding views of faith, views of other Christians, and views of other human beings tells us something about ourselves and about our own spiritual walk. This day, this week, this month, as we interact with those around us, let us think of these two disciples who asked for this preconceived power and see how this thread of living impacts your way of thinking, your way of prayer, your way of believing, and your way of interacting with others whose paths you cross. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the prayers of intercession. Set free from sin and death, and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all of God's creation. Holy One, for the gift of the church handed down through the ages, and for all who carry on the servant ministry of Jesus, we praise you. Send your Holy Spirit upon all who are discerning calls to ministry in its many forms and equip them with your gifts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Creating one for the lush and abundant habitat 
You provide for all creatures, we praise you. Provide healing for the earth, so that waterfowl, reptiles, wild horses, dolphins, and all living things flourish as you intend. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Suffering one, for all who work toward peace and who lead nations with a servant's heart, we praise you. Bring justice for all who suffer violence, persecution, discrimination, hunger, poverty, and homelessness, and create places of refuge for all people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Merciful one, for all who do the work of healing in mind, body, and spirit, we praise you. Surround and comfort all who struggle with depression, anxiety, cancer, diabetes, dementia, viruses, or any illness, that all may be healed. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Sustaining one, for all who volunteer for the vitality of this congregation, we praise you. Strengthen and encourage greeters, ushers, office volunteers, counters, committee and group leaders, teachers, builders, and all who serve with generous hearts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Risen One, we thank you for those who have shaped your church and share your gospel. Through the witness of your saints, continue to inspire us with hope until we are gathered at your eternal feast. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Confident that you hear us, O God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. The living word dwells within you. Thanks be to God.